guys. I'm a whaler guy. I'm Peter Hindle. Jerry Horn is off on assignment. Uh, so tonight we're going to be talking to you about, uh, well, I guess I know the way to say it. Peter Carmanos is uh, back on the scene. You know, I never envisioned when we were talking about uh, the Hartford Whalers when Jerry and I do this show. Uh, you know, Peter Carmanos never entered my mind. I just, you know, it's in the past. He took the team. He left, you know. Um, but he's come back online as, uh, you know, he's been inducted into the, the Hockey Hall of Fame, uh, you know, in, in my opinion, for, for the great amount of charity work he's done with youth hockey. Um, you know, not the, in my opinion, I don't feel like he's a Hall of Famer from the standpoint of what he did on the ice with his team, uh, and especially the decision, uh, you know, moving him out of Hartford. I mean, you're going to tell me I'm the most biased guy in the world on that. That's absolutely true. But uh, I think you'll find out, you know, in the future, and, and we've really seen in the recent past that uh, Carmanos has not exactly run into a gold mine by running out of Hartford. Um, but, you know, what, what, what brings up this whole subject is the fact of is Peter Carmanos being interviewed uh, by the Detroit Free Press uh, and through, you know, many of the questions that are asked about his history, about, uh, you know, his family, about his, his businesses, copyware, uh, his work with junior hockey, along those things line, a question was posed to him uh, about the Hartford Whalers and it said, uh, and I'll read it to you right here, it says, uh, on fans of the Hartford Whalers still being bitter at him for relocating the franchise to Carolina. And Carmanos responds, When we went into Hartford the season before, they averaged 6,000 6, people a game. And that includes games against New York or Boston, where most of the crowd was New York or Boston fans. Hartford's not a big city. Today, if there was a team in Hartford, it would be the smallest market in the league by a mile. You competed for business with all the New York professional teams, all the Boston professional teams, and even a little bit with the Flyers and Islanders. I don't know why the people there are so upset the team hadn't ever won a thing. They had a celebration for a first round playoff loss. Uh, and then further in the interview, it talks about him moving to Carolina. Uh, you know, and he says one of the things he loved about moving to Carolina was, we have the whole market to ourselves in Raleigh and it's a vibrant market. You, you had the whole market here. <laughs> you had the whole market here. There were no other professional teams in Hartford. But uh, you know, hearing about that, um, it makes you kind of wonder, and I'll get to why I think he's actually making a point uh, of talking about Hartford. Because when you got to think of it from his standpoint, he's in Carolina, he's got his red jerseys, he's got that uh, logo that he helped make that per personally I think is pretty, you know, not really a great logo. Uh, but, you know, he's in Carolina, he's been there. This will be his, uh, coming up on his 19th year. And, uh, you know, in all honesty, he, he had some success with the Stanley Cup uh, in 2006. Uh, he's had some issues with Jim Rutherford, who was a Whaler uh, general manager and been Carolina's manager since the beginning. Uh, and Jim Rutherford, you know, at one point Carmelo said he was retiring, and then we see Jim Rutherford ends up in Pittsburgh. And on top of that, uh, Carmanos' son uh, takes a job with Rutherford over in Pittsburgh. And Carmanos has had some statements in the media that have been kind of derogatory towards, um, you know, to, towards Jim uh, so Rutherford. So uh, you wonder about that because when he was, you know, at one point he was, he was praising Ron Francis as new general manager, but he took it in a way to kind of take a shot at Rutherford. So, uh, you know, Carmanos has had his, his run-ins with controversy, and uh, for him to talk about Hartford, you know, we feel that we needed a good response, and, you know, on social media, we did get that. Jeremiah Rafini uh, wrote, um, you know, a nice blog of, uh, article about uh, this whole thing and his feelings of Peter Carmanos, and, uh, you know, he had reported back that he got over 14,000 reads, uh, and he had, he's been getting over thousands of reads on his other pieces, uh, you know, talking about the history of Pucky and all this. Um, so, uh, you know, and I, I wrote something in the Examiner recently, uh, the Today actually, about this, uh, you know, Detroit, D Detroit Free Press article, uh, you know, I got great responses on that, people hadn't thought about how, uh, you know, the take that I took on it, so, uh, but, you know, just to, to talk a little bit about what Carmano said in the detail in, in his Detroit Free Press uh, piece there, you know, he talks about the team being 6,000 fans uh, when he arrived the year before, so he's talking about the, the season 93-94 season. Uh, and he's, he's off. He's off by like 40%. Um, you know, we, uh, the, the Hartford Whalers averaged over 10,000 uh, for that year. Uh, now, you're saying 10,000 is no big deal, and I understand that. But you're talking about a team that won 27 games out of 84. And, you know, that's, just, that's not just one season. The season before that, they won 26. So, I mean, if, if it's getting your goat to get up to go to a game because – this year's team is going to win one more game than last year's team. I mean, it's a rough thing to do, and I don't think any market, uh, you know, wants to, you know, spend a ton of money on a team that's going to, you know, break your heart every night. 
uh, you know, there, there are two kinds of fans, really, in sports, and, and Hartford is uh, one of these, so, you know, I'll go through this real quick, but there's loyal fans and smart fans, and a loyal fan is going to be there through thick and thin. I, th I think you see that kind of with Ranger fans. I think you kind of see that with, uh, obviously, with Maple Leaf fans. You see that with uh, Chicago Cub fans. Uh, you know, those are also bigger markets, but they're loyal fans. They're going to come and go. It's more of an event for them to go to the game. And, you know, if they, if they win, they win. If they lose, they lose. And then there's, there's, there's kind of the smart fan. The smart fan is going to spend his money where he's going to get his most enjoyment. And that's the guy that dies and lives with the team. And uh, so, you know, attendance is going to drop when teams aren't playing well. And the Whalers, you know, they had uh, in, the two, in the 80s and 90s, you know, the beginning of each decade, they had horrendous years. Uh, terrible year, so it was, it was not a fun watch. And uh, you know, to Peter uh, Carmanos's point, you know, there was a game in the playoffs that was around 6,800, uh, but that was the, the following year, and it was a strike year. Uh, and Hartford, being a smart fan again, they were not supporting the strike, and they didn't show up for that reason. So, uh, you know, Hartford being a market that's uh, going to support the NHL is is really more of an argument of, of what the team is doing. If the team's competitive and better, uh, they're definitely going to show up. And uh, Carmanos, I think, knows this too. Uh, but, you know, he went on to say several things about the, the team being 6,000 and, uh, you know, to have, have him say that 6,000 people being that short, uh, especially when, you know, the only thing he's right about is 6,000 is it was last year that the XL Center averaged 6,000 people broke Hockey East attendance records in the XL Center. 6,000 people for college hockey in Hartford, Connecticut, and uh, in, in even uh, other markets, Nesson and uh, Broadcasting had mentioned that, that they, you know, the Huskies got great support for a team that was you know, over 10 games under 500 last year. So, uh, you know, that kind of goes against what I was just saying before, that the team doesn't do well, they don't get supported. But the UConn Huskies in Hockey East, it was their inaugural season. Uh, this year, the attendance has been right on par with last year. Uh, we've had a couple of 5,000 games. Uh, Tuesday night, 4,000 people, they were there to watch Army and UConn. UConn lost 4-2 to two, uh, to Army uh, in a game that they probably should have played better. But we'll get into maybe that a little bit later. But, uh, you know, Last season's UConn was a great thing with the, the attendance, and uh, you know if, if they're pulling at six thousand for college hockey, what does Carmanos think they're pulling for the NHL today? Well, we, we, you know we'll get into that, and he does talk, you know, talk about the New York and the Boston fans inside the arena, and you know he is right about that. There's plenty of Boston Bruin fans in there for Bruin Whaler games. There's plenty of Ranger fans in there for Ranger Whaler games. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say it was overwhelmingly on the opposing team. But, you know, a good portion of the upper bowl, the XL Center, if you see it as, as it is now, you know, you're talking about, you know, 50, 60 percent of the upper bowl had Ranger fans, had Bruin fans. Uh, and that's just the case. Their two-hour drive, uh, it's really a positive, Peter Carmanos, when you look at it, because you have people coming to your market to buy your tickets uh, from outside. So, you know, those are sellouts. Those are automatic sellouts. Uh, and you know, like, you know how many times they play each other in a year. Uh, you could have 10 to 12 games. You know, you could end up being a sellout, uh, especially when you throw in you know the Islanders and the Flyers, and you know there's a lot of regional fans uh, like in the Hartford area. So you know, Carmanos, I don't think he uses that as like a, a negative. But boy, I tell you, I think he'd appreciate having a couple of NHL teams crossing the border into Carolina to go see his uh, team. You know, because uh, currently Carolina is dead last in attendance. Uh, so that's why it's also tough to say when he says 6,000 people in Hartford and you look that, uh, you know, he, he's had a couple of games here with 9,000 and, uh, you know, it was a 10,000 game and they're dead last in attendance and the team's been bad and a lot of the fans tell me, Carolina Hurricane fans, and some of those Whaler fans did switch to Carolina Hurricane fans, they tell me that they're just not happy at all with the way he's run the team. Uh, you know, he did, like I said, the Rutherford and they had, the, they had that big playoff run to win that cup, but, uh, you know, all around that there's been some, some bad decisions. Uh, Carmanos has not been, uh, you know, popular with the Hurricane fans, but, um, you know, he also mentioned about Hartford not being a big city, uh, and yes, that's, again, that's, that's true, but you know, you're not really showing the whole picture here. We're talking about a city that's 17 square miles. <clears throat> when Hartford, uh, you know, first came to be, you were talking about an area that was, you know, pretty much almost like Farmington to Coventry, Connecticut, you know. And as history went along, the team, the towns annexed themselves. So you had, you know, towns would become towns. So Hartford lost land and turned into the 17 square mile city uh, that has 122,000 people, and it has more people per, per square mile than you know a place like Portland, Oregon. Uh, you know, Hartford as a market in terms of a, a, you know we're talking about a radius of 45 minutes. You're talking about 1.3 million people, and that makes it rival with several other markets. Uh, you, you know, SCI report, they were rivaled with uh, Birmingham, they were rivaled with Nashville, 
uh, Columbus, and uh, you know there was another one in there that was a good, a good matchup for uh, Carolina. That's right, it was Carolina. Uh, and in the, you know the metro population right now of, of Hartford is a little bit uh, you know above Carolina, but we're also talking about Hartford as being that 91 corridor, you know, where the uh, you got the New Haven, Hartford, and, and Springfield cities, uh, you know, would all come to an NHL uh, you know arena and a team if it was here. Uh, but you know, Car Carmano's making a knock on on the size of the city. Um, you know, it's it's if you move to a city, it's almost identically the same size in terms of population and metro pop. So, and he doesn't have anyone else to uh, to go to. So, you know, he, he there's no other teams coming to, to to help him out and get Team Fumes fans there. He's not going to get a natural rival. Um, and that, that's one of the things that the Whalers had that no one else had too. You, you know, you had the Bruins so close, you had the Rangers so close, the Islanders were not far away. Uh, you know. There was a lot of rivalry games, uh, and then there were geographic rivals, and then with the Bruins, and even in Montreal, which is only a five-hour drive, uh, you have these, these really good divisional rivals. Um, you know, Carolina kind of doesn't have, they don't have a, a really good rival. Uh, you know, when they go into New York, they, they uh, go and play the, the Rangers, they, they lose every game. As a matter of fact, I think I was talking to someone the other night where Carolina hasn't won a game in New York since they were the Whalers or something along the line, or they lost a a good, uh, you know, 10 to 12 games in, in Madison Square Garden. But, you know, Carolina, I don't, nothing comes to mind with being a, a team with another rival for them. Uh, not like, you know, the Whalers had with the Bruins and the Rangers and, and you know, so forth. Um, and then Carmanos makes that shot about the Whalers not winning anything, uh, which, you know, is kind of strange. I mean, again, you could say, well, they won a division. Uh, and then, they, you know, they won an Africa Cup in Boston, uh, but the same franchise, and they moved here. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they have that one division, Adams division, where they, they were best of the Canadians for the 93 points of 43 wins and 30 losses and seven ties. Uh, and we're able to do that and raise that banner. And, you know, that was the, the previous year, you know, we were talking about a, a parade, which he also kind of made a knock at. He said they, he goes, uh, he said they threw a parade for a, uh, a, f a first round out, uh, out outing or something. And so, you know, really what it was is Hartford, uh, threw a parade because the Whalers uh, won a series, but also took took their level of play almost to the uh, the Wales Conference Finals, uh, and where they would have played the New York Rangers, uh, ironically. Uh, so you know that was you know that many people were excited that the Whalers had enthralled the city. Uh, you know I remember that I was I was a lot younger, but I remember people that I that I knew weren't big on hockey, but they came up to me to talk about the Whalers back then. Uh, because they kind of had grab, grabbed the city, uh, taken it by surprise, and uh, you know they were as good as, as they were on paper and all that. But I don't think people saw them as a team that was going to play that well in the playoffs. And you know Montreal, they took on a serious Montreal team that uh, to this day you know still remembers that, that series as it could have gone either way with the game seven overtime. Um, so you know there are no Stanley Cups in Hartford. You know Carmanos is right about that. You know what, what a genius. But um, you know. The fact that you have 75,000 people show up for a parade for a second round loser. Tell you what, Carolina, let's see, Pete. You go lose in the second round, throw a parade and rally. How many people you got? Because uh, you're not getting 75,000. I don't think so. Maybe you will. Give it a shot. Uh, you know, that was one of the other reasons. Uh, and, and, you know, when you're talking about the size of the cities and rally and Hartford and Nashville and all this, you know, Hartford has um, a little advantage because. Um, if you've been following the CRDA, the Capital Region Development Authority, uh, they hired Stadium Consultants uh, International, uh, the guys that did the revamp on the MSG uh, arena, came here and did a market analysis on Hartford. And it was no bones about it, they made it square and fair. And, uh, you know, Hartford has this 18 year old to 59 year old demographic uh, that, that is right in the wheelhouse. I think they said it was around 55% of the population. Uh, fits that wheelhouse of, of uh, age, and you're probably saying, well, what's, what's that age got to do? Those are the groups uh, of people, that's the age ranges of people that buy tickets to sporting events. Uh, you know, we've kind of seen that with proof with, with UConn, and how many tickets have been bought for UConn. Uh, you know, UConn hockey, basketball, and women's brought in over uh, 250,000 people last year. And that's not including the Wolfpack. The Wolfpack brought in another 170. Uh, so the XL Center has been busy with people these are all these, this group here, this 18 to 59 year olds. Uh, the other thing about Hartford that, it, you know, best other cities was in, in disposable income. Uh, people here make more money than they do in other cities. Uh, and they, and they, you know, they have a little bit of money to spend. So uh, that makes another argument for, you know, the NHL and Hartford. Uh, so, you know, 
there's a lot of Fortune 500 companies here in Hartford. Uh, you know, we have there's five of them in Hartford, and Raleigh just has one. Uh, the corporate support is different. Uh, you know, it was just interesting. This, like I said, for him to take this take on Hartford after all this time, and, and uh, you know, it makes you kind of think a little bit. Maybe there's something else going on, but uh, you know, it was funny to hear him say he had we hadn't really won anything when uh, you know you had the division, and then you know, part of those reasons for not winning were his fault too. He was here. He had the team for so many years. So, you know, maybe it was only three or four seasons, but, um, you know, he was up and out of here real quick. And that was really, uh, you know, it really, it's, it stung a lot of people. And like I said, uh, you know, I thought it was over, uh, but then you see something like this in the Detroit Free Press and you're kind of like, well, he's taking a shot at us. But, um, you know, it, it's a Capital Region Development Authority, uh, you know, was, I was uh, speaking with them and talking with them. Uh, and it makes sense that, um, you know, Carmanos has such a hard time uh, with Hartford because uh, here, here CRDA is telling me that uh, they're residential, so they have nine housing projects, and uh, you know, 85% of them are people that are uh, under 40, are single, are moving in from outside of the city. So these are people that are not from Hartford moving in to Hartford, um, and, and they're young and they're single people, and single and young people, they want to do something on a, on a Wednesday night, they want to do something on a Friday, Saturday night, and that's where the NHL can fit in really nicely. Uh, you know, these many residentials are, you know, the proof that all the people that say that nobody wants to live downtown, uh, there definitely was a need for it. Um, you know, when I talked to Michael Freemuth about it, um, you know, he said it was more of a supply problem than a demand problem. Uh, but, you know, currently they're still a year ahead of their projections, so, um, you know, they weren't expecting that. And they're, I think they're pulling in about 45 rentees a month uh, when they thought they'd only get like 10 a month. Um, so, you know, there are people that want to live downtown, and when you have more people downtown, uh, you know, the campus is coming in 2017. All these people living downtown makes a stronger argument for, you know, a Hartford Whaler Hockey Club downtown, an NHL team. Um, you know, the UConn deal that's been signed, you know, that they're, they're really in the midst of a five-year deal, and they have uh, three more to go after they're already in the second year of this deal, kind of. Uh, even though it's only been finalized, you know, recently. But um, it's pr pretty much going to be the same thing. So UConn's here for the next three years, and then after that, they want to sign a 20-year lease. But um, that has to be nailed down. And uh, you know, it's my feeling that UConn won't want to sign the lease unless those XL Center renovations are complete. Um, so that has to get done. Um, but I think that in order for the renovations, it's almost like catch-22. In order for the renovations to be complete, uh, you know, UConn would have to sign that deal. So. Uh, that's the next step in this whole NHL process. Um, a huge piece of it fell into place finally. Uh, you know, it was almost like passing a kidney stone for Whaler fans, uh, for hockey fans, you know, in, in this area. Um, the atrium of the XL Center had always belonged, or recently since the, the Whalers had left, but uh, had belonged to Northlands, uh, a corporation, a real estate company that had a lot of business in, in Hartford Realty downtown. Uh, you know, in 2006, six seven around that area, they had over uh, half a billion uh, dollars in downtown uh, uh, real estate in Hartford, um, and Larry Gostiner was the, the owner of that, and we had talked about bringing back the Whalers back then, 20, in 2007, had an arena uh, plan, you know, developed, and it was supposed to go where the yard goats are going today, but uh, he also had that front atrium in the Excel Center, you know, the part where the Hartford Wall of Fame, and, uh, you know, you've seen those, if you've been going to the games in Hartford, the escalators are always broken, and the elevators... That was always Northland's uh, issue. They, they had control over that property, uh, but they had issues and they weren't uh, you know, able to keep certain mechanics up to date and these things. So the state needed to gain that back and, and they also needed that to proceed with the renovations. Um, and they did get it back on November 1st. Uh, finally, after all this time, um, the Excel Center is now completely uh, you know, in the hands of the state and the city. Um, so you have the, the atrium and then the arena and everything and now it's all it's all one piece, they can actually do all the work on it because they could not do the renovations without, it, without the atrium. So they needed that atrium and uh, you know, they, they, they finally got it. Uh, I think it was, it was, it was going to get into their hands, I just think it, it was a certain amount of time, it took forever. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was painful, as a person that doesn't know legalese that well, it was painful to listen to how long it was taking to get this atrium because it was, it was insurmountably important uh, to get the Excel Center re renovations. Without it, you can't complete that second concourse, uh, the, con the north concourse, or the east concourse uh, part that uh, you needed to connect that. So, um, you know, that, that was something that was imperative, uh, and it finally fell in. And the other part uh, we talked about a little while ago was the YMCA being moved, and they got the YMCA moved to a great location downtown. 
so the YMCA was happy. They got them out of there, so now they can concentrate on, on getting this renovations done. And in the last uh, CRDA meeting, uh, you know, they talked about revamping and getting this going and this process going, moving uh, the renovations up from three to five years to two years. So, uh, and two years being done with over the summers, getting it completely com uh, done over the summers with second and third shifts. Uh, we're talking about around the clock for two whole summers. And then uh, prior to that, when the, when the season, like when the Wolfpack are playing or when there's Disney on ice or road, off road truck uh, monsters or whatever, uh, they'd be doing some of the mechanicals and things behind the scenes while the building is live. So this whole rush to move the thing up is, is very good. Um, and it goes all full circle onto that Detroit Free Press article because I'm telling you why Carmanos is talking about Hartford now. Because Hartford is back in the business. It's back in. He doesn't want to see a team really come here because he left something here that uh, was worth more than its weight in gold. And that was the Whaler logo. The Hartford Whaler logo that he left here. Uh, I, I can't even imagine the amount of money that that's brought in. Uh, one of the stipulations of him moving the team to Carolina was that he was not allowed to take the Hartford Whaler logo. And it stayed here and it belonged to the state forever. And then the patent on it ran out and then the NHL grabbed it and that's the end of it. So the NHL has it. But originally, all of that money, um, you know, the NHL logo has been number one, number two in the store. It's been a hot seller. It's, uh, it's been fabricated. It's been, uh, you know, everyone's making copies of it. So uh, all these hats, hat makers are making it, all these t-shirt designs, uh, you know, Bob's store is going crazy. Carmanos missed out on all of that. So that's why he's bitter about Hartford, in my opinion. I, I think he's really upset the fact that he, he, he threw gold into the trash. And, uh, you know, well, you've seen the logo they got. Uh, you know, and you see what the Whalers logo does. So, you know, the amount of money that that Whaler logo has brought in, it, it, it would hurt anybody, I think, to lose uh, that amount of money and that amount of publicity for your team. Uh, you know, he could have had all these Whaler Knights uh, down in Carolina if he had control of the logo at the time. Uh, but, you know, he chose to cut, cut it and just leave. And, you know, he even did that with the, um, you know, he did that with the taking down the um, retired numbers in the rafters. Um, you know, he, he, all those numbers went back to the players and the players used them. And the whole point of that was uh, a little bit of a stick it to Hartford, but at the same time it was, hey, well, I'm taking this team and I'm making my brand new own team. And uh, the problem is, is that that team in Carolina is just never, ever going to be uh, as popular with the logo as, as the Whaler logo was. Uh, you know, he, he, I, you know it, it, we don't even, we were, we were pretty much sure that he might even stop by and visit it recently. Uh, you know, we had some, some rumblings of that downtown that he had paid a visit and, uh, you know, and taken a look at the Excel Center plans because, you know, he was shopping his team, but he was doing that the way Robert Kraft did it for the uh, Patriots there, you know, just kind of taking a look, making my home city nervous, make them have to refurbish an arena, which they're doing in Carolina. So uh, it was kind of one of those things, with, which owners do, and I would too. Everybody window shops. I mean, you guys, anybody, when you go out shopping at the mall, you, you take a look at stuff. So that's what all we were doing. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see where this goes, but uh, I'm telling you, without a doubt, um, you know, from, from my opinion, and I think Jerry would agree with me, and uh, I've talked to many Whaler fans, and they, they seem to agree as well that, uh, you know, it really burned Carmanos, that uh, Hartford's gotten its act together a little bit, um, you know, and, and made itself a, a run. Uh, you know, I, I said that, uh, I've always said this to Whaler fans when they ask me if a team's coming back, I say, uh, you know, the point, the difference between then and now is uh, we weren't in the race, now we're in the race. Uh, but we just don't know if we have a nag or we have a thoroughbred. And uh, now I would say that, you know, that race has started. And I, I would say Hartford's in the thick of it. So um, it's, it's, it's definitely one of those situations where you feel like there's a, a legitimately good shot. And, and Governor Malloy had talked about that about two years ago, that there was a legitimate shot. And I think now it's trickled down to guys like me and you, uh, if you're watching this. And you can sense that there's something going on. And people know that Hartford's getting, uh, getting a lot better. So... Uh, but we're going to talk more about that. We'll, we're going to see what we can dig up uh, while we walk around Hartford, Jerry and I, and we check out uh, local uh, restaurants and stuff. So if you see us, uh, say hi. Send us a shout out on email. Um, I'm phindle19 at gmail.com. And Jerry is jewhaler13 at gmail.com. And uh, check us out on uh, YouTube if you want to see more of the show under the Whalers Brigade. So from there we are. Here we go. I'm going to sign off now. One Nation under green. Thanks again for watching. We really appreciate it, and let's go whale. Have a good night.